Yo, what is going on YouTube? It's your boy Dan, aka Adrive. Bring you guys a very special video today. Today we're going to be actually interviewing and talking with the 2018 Pokemon VGC World Champion, Paul Ruiz. What's going on, man? How are you? Hey, what's up, man? Happy to be here. Yeah, dude, I'm so happy to have you on the channel and really, really stoked not only to be able to chat with you about kind of your world's run and ultimately your world's victory, but uh, kind of, you know, just congratulate you on your amazing win and your first ever uh, world championship. You've got a couple accomplishments that are really awesome. Uh, last year, you came in top four at the world championship, which was pretty nuts. We'll talk about that here as well. So you went from going top four to then ultimately winning it. Um, you were also top 16, the LATAM uh, International in 2017. And then I also have you as the Peru regional champion in 2016. But you are from Ecuador and you are the first ever Latin American world champion. So that's incredible, dude. Congratulations. But I got to ask you, like, what does that mean to you to not only win the world championship, but become the first Latin American champion uh, for Pokemon? Well, it means a lot. Like, um, I was dreaming with this since, I don't know, since 2013, maybe 2014. I remember like trying to get better at the time and I dreaming with being the world champ. I it was hard and difficult to realize that uh, Latin America hadn't been like involved in this kind of stuff. Like you we as a as a region I never top cut uh, uh world championships like top eight exactly uh i remember sebastian escalante did like top top something top 16 i guess but yeah for me to be the champion right now at this moment is like has been incredible not only for me for my country for my community and for my continent and region and uh, this this is the proof that dreams really come true when you work hard and hard work always always pays off yeah man that's just super awesome can you give us a little bit of a perspective on what it was like to go top four which was i know your goal like i think you were aiming for top eight last year uh to go top four and then ultimately want to come back and, and try to try to one up that and then win you know kind of what was your perspective after last year going top four which is a tremendous accomplishment in itself uh what was your attitude going into this year uh kind of what were your expectations and also like just how how badly did you want it this year after after being so close last year? Yeah, well, last year I made top four, like you you said, and at that moment I didn't realize like all the all the dream. Like I was like, okay, I I'm gonna try to uh, make top cut and be streamed. Like that was my dream, my goal. I remember that in 2015, I saw the battle, the final uh, with Shoma and I was at home thinking one day I should be there, one day. And I went to the event on 2017 last year with that in mind, like I want to be uh, streamed uh, in Top Cup, not only in Swiss or whatever. And yeah, that, at that point, I didn't realize what was going on. Like, I remember that I went back home and maybe a couple of days after that, I was thinking and I realized, oh man, I was so close to the finals. Like I was rewatching my, my battle against Sam Pandelis and trying to think, why, why did I do that? Like, why? Why did I switch Salamence? Why didn't I just let Snorlax die to get a free switching? And I was like um, pushing myself for that and thinking, okay, so maybe, maybe I can try it again. Maybe that's not enough. Like I made my dream come true, but life is about keep dreaming, you know, and Pokemon, the BGC aspect uh, specifically has like the, the main goal is to be the champion. Like there's nothing else, like there's no, not something above that. So I didn't 
feel like too um too far away when you are top four. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you you think you you could have done a, a bit better and just be there. So this this year I I tried to prepare myself like pushed myself to the limits. I remember I started to build the the team in in April for the Latin America International and I started to practice with it and came with the final version this this August. So there's there's a, a small story about that now that I think about it. After the the success you wanna say it was I had last year, I was thinking like to stop for for a moment. I was thinking that maybe that's enough. Like you should stop, you should you should do other things in your life that also requires your attention, like professional stuff. I have a work and a job and I, I have uh, a family, I'm married and I have personal projects too in Pokemon, like the, the competitive aspect normally drowns you and and you have to sacrifice a lot of things if you want to be the best. So I was thinking of like stopping, but then I realized the thing I was just telling you um that maybe i can try it again and this time maybe be the champion and that was my mentality like i remember i said to a friend and um, this this weekend in nashville when we both made top cut i said i congratulate him he also did that but i already said i also said this is not enough man i don't know if, if this is not for you like make top cut It's already a big accomplishment, uh, but for me, it is not enough yet. I I came with a goal to be the champion, so I, I'm gonna keep trying. And well, you all know the story. <laughs> yeah, man, that's yeah. that's incredible, dude. And I think uh, I, I think that that drive to have to have more and, and like work towards more and ultimately, you know, accomplish that goal is just super inspirational for anyone. Um, we've seen it a couple times now, a couple different instances where VGC players have come really close to winning and then maybe coming back, uh, you know, in a future season and ultimately taking the prize. So that's always really cool to see. And you're like the perfect example of that, of someone who, you know, did so, so well last year to get top four, be in, essentially one of the top four players in the world and then to come back and then actually win it uh, to maybe learn from any tiny mistakes you might've made or uh, maybe just a slight preparation change or whatever it might've been and ultimately result in winning, which is just super awesome, dude. So again, big congratulations to you. And just to pause real quick, everything, uh, all of Paul's stuff is gonna be in the description. So please go follow him on Twitter, send him a congrats on the A-Drive Army. And uh, we're gonna talk about getting him a YouTube channel. I've got his Facebook page and stuff. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But um, so be sure to check out all the links in the description, guys, so you can show Paul some support there. Uh, so that's, that's really awesome, dude. Like, just like super congrats again. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the team. I think that you had a pretty unique team, it seems, uh, especially with the Gastrodon composition. Um, can you give some insight? I'll pull up kind of like a paste here. Um, I'm, we're leaving the EV spreads out. So that way you are going to do like a full proper world's breakdown where you talk about your team and your matches and things like that. So this will be very high level, but can you give us a little bit of insight into kind of what your decision was? There's a couple of interesting choices here, right? So I see the choice specs Coco with the Volt Switch, I thought is really interesting and carrying triple electric coverage. That's something that's very interesting to note. Um, opting to go with a dragon dancing Salamence as opposed to a more special variant with like Hyper Voice. Uh, that's an interesting choice there. Um, I don't know what the standard is on Snorlax now, but I know for a long time, Protect wasn't really standard because people were trying to fit Stomping Tantrum on there. So that's also something kind of interesting. Snatch on Incineroar, another cool tech option. And then Gastrodon in general just seems very, very unique. So um, I guess we'll start from the top here. Could you give us just a basic uh, kind of rundown as to maybe why you decided to run the Specs Coco? Uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the other pieces that I mentioned. Yeah. Um... Coco was was not actually specs from the beginning. It was the, like the standard C crystal Coco with with Electrum C. Um, I remember like like I already said 
I be began with this preparation from from if I remember correctly April or yeah. March. Excuse me. And back in the day, I used the Lectrum C type of Google. And I was like um, trying to have the, the most offensive pressure it can give. Like Electron Coco is, is is just like the best in that regard. Uh, it hit fast, it's strong, and uh, but at the cost of just having one opportunity to hit that strong with the with the Electrum C. The thing was that at the maybe August, like the last period. Um, the last part of the preparation, I realized I was struggling a bit with lightning rod stuff with Charizard and Tapufini, and the main the main issue was lightning rod plus Breviary. Like I have double intimidate and Breviary paired with Raichu was a pain from from the team for the team, so. I realized that maybe, maybe I had to put this chart somewhere. And when you think about this chart, you have to consider like, okay, so if I put this chart in a Tapu Koko set, what do I uh, sacrifice for that? I'm not sacrificing protect for an electric for an electron set. Like that's, there's no way I'm gonna go with electron without protect, just to put this chart instead of protect. Like if. You understand that mm -hmm. what I mean. So I I thought that maybe lecture was not the correct option. If you want to use a set with discharge, you have to consider another option. So the first thing that comes to mind when you when you think about discharge is a spec set. So I try to optimize the the set. I um, change the spread because Electrum Coco, the set I was using was a straight 252, 252 for. But when I used the specs, I changed the spread. I I remember I keep the 252 in speed. I want to hit as fast as, as the Coco can to speed tie with others, Coco and Gengar. Uh, but I remember I put some book it is 60 EVs in HP and something like around 20 EVs in defense to to have a really high chance to leave the stomping tantrum from Metagross. And yeah, that's that's the reason why the, the, the set is a cherry specs, Coco. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense and that damage output is really nice. Um, so like I said, I don't want to go too in depth with your team because I know you're going to kind of do that on your own. So maybe real quick, I want to talk a lot about Gastrodon, but I also want to touch on the uh, Snatch Incineroar. Um, we see a lot of Incineroars running Assault Vest. You opted to run the Figgy Berry to give you that extra kind of health boost. Uh, you have a, a more defensive nature with careful nature there. Um, so can you kind of explain your decision to run Snatch uh, over maybe something else, uh, like a knockoff or something like that, or a U-turn? Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe Snatch is going to steal stat boost from other Pokemon. So if a Pokemon tries to go for like a Calm Mind or a Sword Stance, you steal the stat boost from them as opposed to them using it. And I believe it has enhanced priority in order to do that. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so true. yeah. So what was your choice on on Incineroar and kind of what was in what was you what were what did you have in mind when you were putting Snatch on there and, and like what boost were you trying to take? Was it like Sword Stance from Landorus and Garchomp? Was it uh, Dragon Dances from things like uh, maybe Mence or? uh you know kind of what was the main target of that snatch yeah okay um snatch was part of the first uh version of the team like when i started to build i used snatch i actually remember i used snatch crafty in australia back in february like i remember using snatch on my crafty before in incineroar was released with the hidden ability um, so when I um, realized Incineroar was way better than Scrafty, I told to myself, okay, I'm going to keep with the Snatch tech. Why? Well, the first thing that this, this metagame has a lot of, uh, of setup. 
and not only stat boost, but also tailwind. Yeah, there's a lot of speed control, and snatch uh, works with tailwind. Like you snatch the tailwind mainly from Sapdos and from other Charizards, and you you put yourself in a very good position, and you can have that extra option to another speed control. And not only that, uh, when I uh, continued playing with the team and improving it and fixing stuff, I realized that I can't even snatch my own recover. So I had like a fifth move. I remember like doing a snatch in with, with Incineroar paired with Gastrodon using recover and Incineroar is just recovering all, half of its health with no recover as a move, like just, yeah. just having the, the option. And sometimes you can just do that with your own partner sometimes, or the main reason is do it to take it away from your opponent. Um, like Sabdos, for example. Sabdos was staple of the metagame, yeah, just one of the most used Pokemon at events, if I'm not mistaken. And Sabdos normally relies on speed control for the team and Roost. And Roost, and he can spam Roost all day, like Yuri does. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you're not Roosting in front of my Incineroar, no way. I'm gonna spam Snatch and you're not Roosting. If you want to attack me, you can attack me with Thunderbolt, but the thing is I most likely gonna have a partner that, that's gonna take care of you, like Gastrodon, for example. Sabdos cannot touch Gastrodon. And you can Ice Beam to the point you, f you are forcing it to Roost, but you Snatch the Roost, so there is no way out. And also, you can snatch substitutes, um, mainly for Cartana. For example, you have to predict that. It's, it's not that easy, but you can do if you want. Like the, the main the main use of snatch in my team is for Roost, Tailwinds, and Belly Drums from Snorlax. Like this is this is, in my opinion, a better way to handle Snorlax than knockoff. Yeah, that's such a like good insight there, I think. Um, obviously, uh, an average or novice type player, I don't think would be able to function with Snatch, but someone with your expertise and your skill in this game um, and just knowledge of competitive Pokemon, uh, you could make use of such a uh, high risk, high reward type play. Um, and, and I think like one of the things that I wanted to mention is it looks like your team here um, really, if you take away what Incineroar does with Snatch and you take away Gastrodon's ability to wall Zapdos, it does seem like your team struggles against Zapdos generally. Um, yeah. So you could really see the pieces together and how you kind of built it and said, okay, like now it, it really starts to make sense as to why Gastrodon was such a good pick for you as a way to wall out that that um, Zapdos. So uh, so I, I'm assuming, um, you know, I played mostly the, the 17 metagame. Um, so the 18 one is a, a little bit kind of foggy for me and kind of what became mainstay but i would i would venture to guess that groundium z gastrodon is probably not the standard so what made you decide no. to rock uh you know with the groundium z on gastrodon um and, and ultimately you know it seems like you were at least somewhat special attack invested here a pokemon that's mostly known for its its bulk um you know kind of what was your decision on gastrodon obviously we know about the zapdos counter but what else is obviously ice beams really nice for landorus that ground mz what what were those calcs like what were you aiming to be able to take out with ground mz that just earth power couldn't do and that barry really wasn't necessary for yeah the main thing about gastrodon is like for me it was like the the best option for the metagame like when incineroar was intimidated incineroar was released people started to use the double cat option like landorus incineroar so what do you have in front of you? You have a fire type that's weak to ground and water, and you have a flying and ground type that's weak to water and ice. I didn't use the step water option because I didn't think it was worth it, but Gastron has the coverage for, for both of them. So you have the step earth power like ground step in this metagame is so great man it, it hits a lot of things i remember last year um i said that 
there are a lot of a lot of players that don't realize all the ground weakness they have they had at the time and in this meta game i i realized that there are a lot of players that are doing that as well like they have night legal they have Incinero, they have coco they have a lot of ground weaknesses and normally they try to patch the that with flying like putting landers there but you cannot be safe in front of a gastron that can ice being you in the switching like i did in the finals mm -hmm. um so gastron was really good for that and also because of the 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 used the use that metagross was was having like metagross was at that time i remember the standard set was some potential nice punch and um iron head so that that set cannot touch gastron like cannot touch all the water the bulky waters like suicune or mylotic but gastron in particular is a ground type so you can pressure it and earth power does not get the ko on metagross so i was like okay i need that extra extra power for the team because uh, it helps a lot like i i have a salamence that doesn't have coverage so in front of a metagross i cannot touch it um i have an incinerator that usually would be the perfect counter but Game Freak decided to give Metagross a dumping tantrum. So it is not a, a perfect counter. Um, and also I remember I had in the team, I had an Amungus instead of a Cortana. So Amungus was not a, a counter because um, Metagross is psychic type. And a lot of uh, times people started to use the same head with option two, just to have that um, that option that normally you wouldn't expect from the standard set. So Gastrodon was the perfect choice. Like it, it had an advantage against Metagross, against Sabdos, those of, of the most um, uh, difficult Pokemon to deal in, in the team I had and the version of the team I had at that point. I was testing first before Gastrodon, I was testing an Sumeril with with uh amungus instead of cortana that was the the, the original team like it was coco man's incinerator and then it was uh amungus Sumeril, and celestila that's the team i brought to to brazil and then after that tournament i realized celestila wasn't that good um so i i started to use snorlax like a, a hard heater uh, and also a Snorlax can be everything. Like it can be a pivot. It can be hard heater. Once it's set up, um, you can use it just without the boost, just to spread chip damage to the opponent to the point Salamence can sweep. Um, yeah. And then uh, a Sumeril just gave me another weakness to Coco. And uh, at that point I was like, okay, I don't have, something that resists coco another than amungus but i cannot count on amungus uh that much because coco normally is paired with the fire type like incinerator or charizard so amungus is not that great against them and i realized uh i needed a water type but i also needed uh Sorry, a ground type. So I was considering landers, like everyone. Mm -hmm. why, why not use landers? And I realized, okay, I, I cannot use landers. I have inti in intimidated with Incineroar and with Salamence. I don't want to add another intimidate. That would be a disaster against defiant users or competitive users like Mylotic. And I'm not um, giving up Salamence. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm going to use Salamence. I'm pretty sure I'm going to use Salamence at worst. That's what I thought at the moment. I'm not changing Salamence to, uh, with Landorus. Like, if I have to choose, I'm going to choose Salamence and Landorus. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had the, to think another option, and that's when Gastrodon appeared. Like, it was a different role that Asumeril 
uh, was was using, uh, but it covered all the the weaknesses like almost perfectly. It gave me another option, a really consistent option to hit Tyranitar and to wall the rock slide spam because Incineroar and Salamence both are weak to rock. So normally sand teams with Tyranitar or even the, the standard Tyranitar, Fini, Sabdo, Mongoose, and uh, Landorus team, which is I, I don't have, I didn't have at that point something that resists uh, rock slide. So Gastron was was the perfect pick there, and the the ground like I already said, was just to 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 make the team more consistent in my opinion. Like you have, for example, you have uh, a Metagross in front of you. If you don't have the ground and sea, you can earth power it for sure, but you're not killing it. So it, it maybe it's gonna kill your Salamence with Ice Punch, or your Tapu Koko with with something Tantrum if it, it is in range. So. I wanted that option to protect my Pokemon and just kill the, the the opponent. Like that's the main reason why I used the ground and see. And also, I didn't want to have another berry uh, in my team because at that point, at that moment, I had Incineroar with berry, I had um, Snorlax with berry, I had Amoongus with berry, and I didn't want to put a Gastrodon with berry. Like there is food for knockoff everywhere. Like just just lose your berries in front of an incinerator. So I realized ground and sea was the best best item for the the extra power and the specific scenarios where you need the extra power. And also you are not that weak to knock off and you are actually taking less damage from it. So in front of an incinerator, Gastrodon just have a field day. Very cool. That, that's the reason. Yeah, no, I oh, mean, when no. you look at the team, it, it, it like really fits fits perfectly. And your explanation there for Gastrodon just makes it seem like it was uh, like a perfect fit. And I think in order to win a world championship, you have to have a team that just synergizes so perfectly together. And you can see not only from your explanation, but just looking at things like Goko discharging. Uh, Gastrodon's a great partner for that, obviously, with its immunity there. Um, and it just patches up a lot of those weaknesses like we talked about, um, you know, with your, your Salamence. Carrying only yeah, one attacking move, uh, making Zapdos a little bit trickier. You seem to have kind of all the checks there. So um, definitely some cool stuff. Why why Gastron was modest, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And yeah, I EB that with 84 EVs in special attack, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And that's because I wanted to always, always kill Coco. And with, I think it, it was with 68. EVs, you always kill Coco uh, with Earth Power, but I gave it a bit more to have a better chance against Nihiligo. Like the roll was completely my favor. It was not a hundred percent, but it was. I think it was a ninety-three percent with eighty-four EVs. Also Nagana Bell and stuff to have that that um, to have the option to not use the Ground DMC when you can just use Earth Power and. Uh, of course, it also makes the Ice Beam roll on Landorus's way better. Like, you always KO Landorus, no book Landorus with Ice Beam, something that uh, a non modest Gastrodon not, uh, cannot do 100% of the time. I was like, okay, with Ice Beam, I KO Landorus 100% of, of the time if it doesn't have a uh, book. And if it does have bulk, it's a roll in my favor. Like you have to be really, really bulky to lift an ice beam from this gastron spread. And that's, for example, what happened at final finals. Yeah, uh, he had uh, he had he definitely some bulk on that. Uh, that a lot. <laughs> I think it lived on like 36 HP or something like that effect, but. Uh, as I mentioned before, you're going to be doing a full team breakdown. So I don't want to go too much further here because I don't want to take away from that. But guys, be sure to follow him on Twitter and stuff to keep an eye out for that because I'm definitely excited to read your world's report. I know you're going to go super duper in depth and really talk about this team and um, just great masterpiece of Pokemon put together here that really cover each other's weaknesses and synergize so well together. And uh, some really cool pieces of tech there that I think uh, obviously ultimately paid off. And, and I'm interested to read and kind of hear a little bit further uh, from there. I know we had a couple other things we wanted to talk about. Um, so 
let's kind of move to the next topic here uh one of the things that i know you and i both kind of talked about before we started recording was our, our love for shiny pokemon and you brought a few different shinies uh this event you had a shiny gastrodon you had a shiny mega salamence and a shiny snorlax and there was a little bit of controversy about i guess the legitimacy of those shiny pokemon um so i know you kind of wanted to address that really quickly so uh the stage is yours my friend thank you yeah like i said to you um, before recording i always loved the that aspect of the game like i was a, i'm a passionate of pokemon in all all the ways you can imagine like i like the competitive aspect aspect that's why I invested a lot of time to practice and now I I am the world champion. But I also loved all the, the, the mechanics, the, the the story, the adventure itself and all the things that normally a non-competitive player can also enjoy from the game, the game we love. And I love shinies, like I, I've spent, I don't know, months entire months of my life just uh, doing this this thing the shiny breeding i don't normally do shiny hunting like you do like i don't like uh, that much to for example invest a lot of time trying to get a shiny that's not competitive i want sh competitive shiny so the best way is uh, at, at the time i started doing this was uh, just doing the masuda met and I've sp spent a lot of, of hours and weeks and tired doing this. I had a lot, a lot of shyness in my in my DS and all my games, and I did that for this specific team. The thing is that people like with this this guy that's crazy and and doing all these videos about uh, players. People uh, are expect uh, suspecting that because I tweeted that I left my DS at, a, at my country. So they are like saying, oh, what, how do you get all the shiny Pokemon in one day? Like, I don't know if they don't know that something that's called trade, like exist. And I, I, I don't really understand how people can forget that. Like, yeah, the thing, the thing was that I left my DS at, at, at my country, but the specific part what I led was at my work. I was uh, at work, I was charting it, and I had a couple of issues, I remember on Thursday, that made me like not be focused on, on, on this. I, I had to focus on other things. And when the time come, uh, I had to just go to the airport from my work. I didn't even have the time to go home first I had all the things with me at my work and it was like 11 something in the night so I forgot my DS and I realized that in the United States the next day so I when I arrived to the airport I connected to Wi-Fi and said a friend and my friends this this nightmare was happening and a, f a good friend of mine Mr. Penguin uh, offered like dude I can go to your office ask your partner and say that uh, give me your DS and I, I was like really you're gonna do that and yeah for sure just just talk to him and, and let him know that I'm gonna be there and I was like thank you so much thank you for everything I remember I messaged my work um, partner and said Dude, I led my DS there. I have my team there. There's a man that's gonna uh, go to take it. Please give it to him. And then my my friend uh, traded the team, so I can uh, register and check in the 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 day after. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, that's, you, you... I, I I built this team. I breed this team with with weeks. Like that was something that at the end I. When I I did the same last year, like I, I had a big tournament in my mind that I was focused on, so I focused on the competitive as aspect, but I also focus on this non-competitive aspect that I want to use the 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 mon the, the Pokemon I loved 
in a shiny version. Like I love Salamence. I have a lot of, of shiny Salamence. Like I've read like, I don't know, eight different shiny Baggins, each one with a different nature. Like that's something that people, I don't know, don't understand. That's not that you breed competitive. When you're competitive and you also have the passion for shinies and you want to use your shinies at a competitive uh, level, you have to have a lot of um, different natures for that shine. So I had a shiny naive Salamence. I have a shiny Jolly Salamence. I have a shiny Adamant shiny. That's crazy, man. I spent a lot, a lot of time doing that. I love, I love shiny. So that's, that's why um, I try to use the shiny Pokemons that I love in the event. Yeah. And, and I want to kind of give my perspective on this really quickly. Um, as someone who's shiny hunted, uh, I have over 600 shinies myself. I dedicate a ton of my channel uh, to shiny hunting and I competed at St. Louis regionals uh, for the 2017 format. And I brought a team that had, I believe five out of my six Pokemon were shiny. Um, and all my team was obtained legitimately and it was obtained within a week of the event. Um, so it's 1 million percent possible to have three Pokemon on your team be shiny. Uh, the Masuda method is with the Shiny Charm, about a 1 in 512 chance to get a Shiny, which roughly yeah. equates to, you could assume, about 40 eggs per hour of hatching. And, and you had mentioned to me before this call that you would hatch at work sometimes and on your breaks and things like that. So if your preparation began in, in April, there's no reason to believe that you wouldn't be able to get these Shiny Pokemon. A lot of times you can get them quickly. I've gotten Shinies in five eggs before. Like, it's very, very plausible, very, very possible. And a lot of people fail to realize that when you're breeding for Shawnees, um, you're controlling the nature with an Everstone, so you can always get the nature you want. Um, and then in terms of stats, you can control five of the six IVs, but then there's also the option to bottle cap those stats later on. So any perfect stats, um, or imperfect stats rather, can be fixed. One thing I note about your team is you have no hidden powers, which are something that is a little bit more challenging to breed for. Um, you don't have yeah. anything like that. So there's really no reason uh, a, a, a reasonable person to assume that you hacked your Pokemon for this event when everything you have used is perfectly capable and obtainable in the game. So I think anyone making assumptions or claims that you're hacking is just uh, really unfair and just looking for drama and news. So um, I, like I said, as someone who's shiny hunted a lot, there's really no reason to make the assumption that you hacked your Pokemon uh, just because they were shiny. Again, all these Pokemon are obtainable. And realistically, yeah, it would take a decent amount of time, but not really. Like, if you knew you wanted a modest shiny Gastrodon, uh, you could, in, in theory, get that within a few hours, and, and you have that yeah. Gastrodon. You could change its moveset. None, like, this moveset is a, a TM moveset with uh, heart, heart scales. I mean, none of these are, like, egg moves aside from maybe the Snorlax. Uh, I believe yeah, the cycle uh, is on Munchlax, but... Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I know we wanted to kind of diffuse that, and, and I 100% I am on board with you, and, and you know, I, I think anyone who says otherwise just, Thank you, uh, Thank you know, yeah, doesn't it, understand. It was, uh, we we need to have this conversation, like, uh, at least for for a moment to to address this stuff that it's not fair by any means. Like, I, I don't think uh, people that it's involved or, or had been involved in this shiny experience, like doing the Masuda method or just shiny hunting like you do, cannot like understand there's like a lot, a lot of time to do this. Not it's something that I did in one day. I had, uh, I had friends. I had, I even had, I, I said I had a wife and that's something these guys uh, talk, speak and, and said in the video. Um, but yeah, I, I am a passionate of this, you know, shinies and and the, the strategy, of course. But it, it is not fair when someone tried to just get likes uh, on a video, just um, talking bad things about you. And that's something that I, I really thank you for the time and, and this opportunity to, to address that. Yeah, for and sure. I, I had a question for you, like you said, uh, you had a shiny in five eggs. Yeah, I've gotten a bunch uh, quickly. <laughs> is, that, is that your like your um, your like fastest? The, the, less, the fastest shiny you you had? No, so I've actually gotten a few instances. I had a, a shiny legendary Palkia um, in in yeah, one but reset. Breeding. 
Breeding. Uh, oh, breeding. Yeah, I would say uh, I did hatch a first egg, a uh, shiny Drifloon once. Um, oh, yeah. That was that was the, the, the main thing why I asked you. Yeah. I remember one time, one, there was a time that I was um, doing all these Masuda things, and I remember I ha I wanted to breed a competitive egg slash. So I started with the Honage, and I hatched the first egg, and then it was shiny. I was like, what? <laughs> first one? Oh, my God. I remember that like it was yesterday. And uh, I remember it was in, in X and Y, and sadly for me, the uh, Honage was not perfect with IVs, but I didn't care. I used a non-perfect IVs uh, egg slash just because it was shiny. It was mine, and I... I uh, read, read it, and people didn't know it was not perfect. Like it was my <laughs> secret. Yeah, it, it, it didn't was it didn't had the, the have the 31 IVs in special defense. It had like 20 or something, and I didn't know. I didn't. This is perfect. Like, I'm not saying um, my shines are not that strong. This is my secret, but. That's a, a small story. <laughs> That's cool, man. That's cool to get that first encounter. Um, so we've spent a, a lot of time already talking. There's a few other topics I want to talk about briefly. Um, so real quick, uh, I want to talk about that championship match you had, uh, kind of your your match against um, Emilio, um, which was a 2-0 win for you. It seemed like going into that match, you had all the confidence in the world. You were feeding off the crowd. You were you were really you were really locked in and in the zone. Um, we'll talk really quickly about a couple of those turns there. Uh, game one, you know, he leads that Gengar, that Mega Gengar, which is, is kind of trapping your Pokemon in, putting you in a little bit of a tough spot there. And you stuck with your Mega Salamence Gastrodon lead in both games. Um, I'm assuming to kind of keep the pressure off his Landorus, uh, kind of keep that at bay. I know you had to deal with that Latios, which was a little tricky. Um, you know, you, you go for that turn one Tectonic Rage into his substitute on the Gengar. Um, kind of give me a little bit of your strategy going into game one and game two. I'm, I'm assuming you really knew about each other's teams at that point because you had the information from, you know, the previous matches and stuff like that. Kind of what was your approach, I guess, going into that game against Emilio, knowing he was going to try to trap you with that Gengar? Uh, it seemed like, from my perspective, your game plan was like, I got to get rid of that Gengar because at that point, like, Storlax can really just put in a ton of work. We saw that in game one. Game two is a little bit trickier because he made some really, really good switches. It seemed like you were slow playing game two, just waiting for your opportunity. But kind of give us a little perspective there on kind of what your game plan was going into that match. Uh, was it indeed to just kind of get rid of that Gengar and let Snorlax put in the work? Or what were you thinking? Yeah, um, I remember that night I, after I defeated um, Nils in the top four match, I didn't even know who was my opponent. And my friends told me. I remember I arrived to the hotel like really late, like 12 or something. And I started to prepare the matchup and um, digging in the stream I realized his Gengar doesn't, didn't have a uh, sludge bomb and he didn't have a way to touch Snorlax with Gengar other than perish and normally against Gengar teams I don't like to use Snorlax because of the fact that Snorlax my particular set doesn't have a way to touch ghost so it's easy for them to just trap me and, and, and bring the, the counter to Snorlax and and I'm done. So normally I don't like to do that. <clears throat> but when I realized he didn't have a sludge bump, I was like, okay, Snorlax could work here. And the, the main moment in that preparation process the night before, I realized Snorlax was really good was when I uh, knew that his Incinerator didn't have, I, I guess it didn't have knockoff. It had um, U-turn, fake out, protect, and I assumed it was Flare Blitz. So there's no knockoff on the Incinerator. There's no knockoff on, on landers that could also have knockoff, like in the early game metagame days. Um, yeah, but I kind of uh, prepared the matchup watching the stream from the day two and realized Snorlax was really good. Like, really, I just had to. And the main way to put pressure ground, you'll see Gastrodon. 
But also, I realized that his Gengar was bulky. Was bulky. I, I realized that uh, at uh, the preparation process because of the stream. Yeah, and your, like, okay. your Mega Salamence Mega Evolved before his Mega Gengar yeah. did as well, Salamence which kind of tipped that off too. Yeah. Because it, that's not a coincidence. I built my Salamence spread to be faster than the bulky Gengars that were um, um, using, people were using at, in the meta game at this point. So I beat my Salamence. Actually, my Salamence began <clears throat> in April with a very, very bulky spread. I much speed. And it was kind of open through months until the last because of the, the, the point the metagame was like back in April there was no Gengar if I remember correctly. And if there was a Gengar it was like straight to fifty two to fifty two. But the metagame evolved at the point that Metagram um, Gengar was bulky to counter Metagross. So it lived this stumping tantrum and can kill it um, in two hits, maybe. So I was realizing that my Salamence should be faster with time. Should be faster than Ludicolo in rain after a Dragon Dance. And then I realized it should be faster than Breviary in Tailwind. And I started to optimize the speed to speed at a point with when I was like, okay, I'm I'm just so close to outspeed the bulky Gengar spreads, so why not just do it? And that that was why my Salamence outsped his Gengar. So when I realized that, I was like, okay, this is this is really really great for me. Salamence outspeed Gengar. His Gengar doesn't have icy wind. His Gengar doesn't even have a way to touch Snorlax. I was like talking with a friend and I said, I remember I said, okay, if, if the match even goes to, to an end game with Snorlax and Gengar, I'm going to go for the struggle, man. Like he cannot touch me. I cannot touch uh, his Gengar too, but I have more PP. So Gengar is not a counter to my Snorlax. That, that, I had to use Snorlax efficiently to put pressure on the partners and let something take care of Gengar, like Gastrodon, uh, uh, Salamence, and Sinner. I have a, a couple of Gengar um, strong choices against it. So the fact that Salamence was faster was a huge, huge plus. I knew that even if he protect Gengar, Simus uh, going through protect was, was an advantage for me because I know I can chip it at the point a double edge, even a minus one double edge would kill. And that that's actually something that happened. Minus one double edge killed the Gengars and, and he didn't expect that because he led the Gengar to to at the field. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um the match was was in my favor in, in game one. Game two he tried to uh, switch a, a little bit the, the his strategy. And that's why he led Ladias. But I actually the Ladias was kind of tricky for me because I didn't know what set it was. Like I just knew it had Ice Beam and Protect. I didn't know anything else. I asked a lot of people, but no one could tell tell me. So I was like, okay, let's just assume things. I do the math, and I remember I saw the top four I guess match he had against a Japanese player and the Japanese used double edge with his Snorlax and killed the Ladias one shot it because it was banded I, I guess and I was like okay I cannot know the the, the, the HP from Ladias because that would be um, a good option to know if it is bulky or not but I cannot Calc it with the recoil that Snorlax just had, and I calc it, and I realized it had something like 52 EB in HP. So I was like, okay, this Ladius is offensive. It should be offensive. It doesn't have bulk. It died from that. The recoil was that, and I was like, okay, what items could it have? Have 
the first thing that came to mind was to see Crystal, but I didn't know. I didn't know anything about the Latias. So when I saw Latias in game two, it was like, okay, let's let's assume it is offensive and try to play around that. So I switch, I remember Snorlax, because that was the great the great moment to to set up. If I, for example, had switched uh, Incinerator, which counters perfectly Gengar and Latias, that was just a bait to bring Landers and Tectonic Rage me, and I can, couldn't switch out. So that's why I didn't want to bring Center, and I opted for Snorlax. And Snorlax just can one-shot everything barring the Gengar. And also, because the, the, the concept of the team he had was a Parish Trap team, his, his incinerator didn't have uh, knockoff. Instead, they had protect. I remember I played a lot of games in Shodan in my training process against those kind of teams. And I remember I realized the incinerator in those archetypes is min speed because of the fact that they want to have the, the, the safe switching to Gengar, so you, you want to U-turn uh, to have a slow U-turn to bring back the Gengar safely. So this is the thing. I beat my Snorlax to outspeed mean speed in Senator. I was part of my process, my building process going to Worlds. So when I saw uh, in, in the night before that his Incineroar uh, was a slow U-turn, I started to think this might be a mean speed in center. Like it has to be. It's a pair strap. You want to be slow, so in in, in a late game, for example, Paris count the Paris turn counts to zero. You are the slowest one possible, and you win. So there was a lot of of, of thought process in that. Like you want to bring the Gengar safely. You had to be a mean speed in center, and my Snorlax. If you, that's the case, my Snorlax will outspeed you. So I, I wanted to um, put him in, in, a, in a position where he had to to like try to attack and realize, oh, his, incinerator, his Snorlax is faster than my Incinerator, so I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. That's why I brought the, the, the Snorlax to set up and, and bait the Incinerator or the Landorus and that's um, also the reason why he forfeited in game one, because he he knew that my Snorlax was faster. Something that, for example, the the, the stream didn't didn't know the, the commentators, the, the cast. Yeah, um, that, they, they didn't know. Yeah, dude, they didn't that's, realize that. <laughs> that's really cool that uh, you kind of explain just how much went into this team and, and really like every specific scenario, it almost seemed like it was uh, meant to be that you had that matchup there in the championship and you won it pretty uh, pretty handily. I mean, uh, you, you ended up uh, forfeiting in both games. Um, one really small thing I wanted to touch on too, uh, since we're doing uh, an opportunity to kind of clear the air, I saw you tweeted about it. There was an instance that brought up a little bit of drama where your opponent actually reached out to shake your hand after you kind of realized yeah. you had won. And anyone who watched the stream, I don't know how anyone can make drama out of this, you clearly had your eyes covered with your hands. So I just wanted to mention that. There was no way that you were being disrespectful to your opponent. You ended up shaking your opponent's hand afterwards when the game was kind of sealed after you Dragon Dance with Salamence there. Um, but I saw a little bit of drama in the community saying, oh, he reached out to shake his hand and you just didn't shake his hand. But very clearly, you didn't notice. Uh, you had your hands over your face. Obviously, a very emotional moment for you when you kind of realized, I got this. I'm the world champion. This is awesome. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that really quickly because, again, I, I don't think that was fair critique of you. I don't think uh, under any circumstances you were trying to be disrespectful. I just simply think you didn't see your opponent reach his hand out. Um, and I'm sure that that all aligns with kind of what you're thinking. Uh, one other point I wanted to talk about with the match really quickly is a uh, very interesting last turn or close to last turn in that game two where your opponent decides to substitute with his Mega Gengar and you go, you instantly knew you hit it with the Snarl. Obviously Snarl being a sound move, going through substitutes. Do you think Emilio just forgot that uh, Snarl was going to go through the substitute? Do you think he just didn't want to risk a double protect? 
What do you think happened there? Because you knew exactly what you were doing, uh, but it seemed like, you know, uh, Emilio, I, I don't know if he was just shocked. I mean, it, it was it was kind of a weird play because you were so confident in that Snarl play knowing you were going to knock out the Gengar at that point once it substituted, but it, it, it seemed like a strange play on Emilio's part. So what do you think kind of was going through his head there when he went for substitute? Obviously, he was kind of on the back foot anyway, but what, what were your thoughts on that? Well, um... To be honest, I don't really know. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> like maybe he forgot about the, the sound move going through protect, maybe. Or maybe he thought, uh, okay, um, maybe he concentrated too much on the, the, the parish, um, parish strategy. And normally, uh, players that do that kind of strategy try to tend to always get protect and double protects and that's why he even have a sub in a Gengar. Like you don't need a sub Gengar to, to be effectively with, with your parry strap. You maybe could have used, I don't know, disable or town or whatever. But he had a sub in in his set. So it's clear to me that he want to to um, exploit the parish the best uh, way possible so i think in that like you you can attack like you can actually do damage to your opponent and not only um and wait to the the parish turns to to go down and that's something that maybe maybe went against him like his his um he concentrated too much in the parish thing like maybe thinking, okay, I got the parish. I have to protect the parish, right? and and that's that's how you protect a parish. You you um, protect, then you sub, then you protect again, or or you switch with U turn and bring the Gengar at the other slot, like he did a lot of times. And but he had he wanted. It seems to me that he wanted to protect the parish at all costs. So that maybe went against him. Yeah, a best a best play. A play that I was expecting was he switching to Ladias and Earthquake, or maybe he sub, but but Earthquaking his own sub. Um, that's why when he sub, I didn't um, react instantly. I was waiting to see what was the lander is doing, because he could have Earthquake himself and kill the the the, the incinerator. So it would have been like. Um, in that case, um, landers would have gone be gone because I used frustration on that slot. It would have been uh, men's Solomon's with my Snorlax against his Ladias and Gengar late game. So it would have been trickier. But that that was the moment I was waiting for. It's like, okay, what is the landers doing when I? saw the u-turn text then i realized okay i got this then i started to to feel like i am i can be the world champion in this turn yeah and yeah that's what happened that's that's super awesome man yeah that's really cool um okay so let's let's kind of talk about a couple other quick things here uh because we've already gone to about an hour um so i want to i want to try to wrap things up relatively soon but uh, real quick, we've got your Facebook page here. I know we wanted to mention that. Uh, there you are looking yeah. awesome uh, as your uh, your World Championship post there. So I'm going to have this in the description below. I know you're going to use this kind of to leverage in the future. So uh, we'll make sure that we'll put this in the description below for anyone else who wants to kind of check that out. Um, I did want to talk to you really quickly about the 2019 season. Obviously, we just had that announced that there's going to be a couple different formats. You got the Sun Series, the Moon Series, and the Ultra Series. Uh, can you give us just a basic idea of what your thoughts are of this new format? Are you excited about it? Are you planning to compete, uh, trying to defend your title? Kind of what's your plans moving into the next season? And uh, what are your thoughts of the kind of the format in general? Okay, the format to me seems really cool. I mean, I'm actually surprised uh, Pokemon did this. Like... I wasn't expecting seeing this someday, like switching formats between uh, a season. It's something that I know a lot of players were um, saying before, like why why do we have to be stocked in, in, in uh, format for a whole year? 
I mean, sometimes even more than a year. And when I saw this, I was like, okay, they're actually, they're actually uh, doing this. They, they want to um, encourage the, the players to keep keep uh, having fun. That's that's the main the main issue with with a format that's long, too long. Players tend to get bored, and and there's sometimes for a lot of players, not not to me, but there is a like um, there's no fun playing this for months and for months and for months. So I think this is a really good uh, step forward in BGC. I hope they kind of continue with this. Maybe not three, but two. I, I'm not sure if. if like the, the 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 dates are um enough to develop a metagame uh well well developed metagame so but we'll see this is the first time they're doing this and we have to try it and i like i like the fact that they are like banning stuff uh, to make like a different completely different form and there's a big difference in a format without mega stones that in a format with mega stones and of course the main the main attraction if you can say that to to this format is that you can use restricted months um that's not changing in any in any series but secret cells and items uh, really strong items uh, are changing so i think it encourages like better Uh, preparation you have to be really um go deep and deeper in the in the building processes and and the cogs and that because you don't have that much time there are a lot of people that tends to wait to see what other players do so they can like try to adapt that sometimes copy sometimes just trying to use it but adapt some some things they are you used to and put some like um his their play style in, in that team but when you have small periods of time you cannot like do that that much you have to build your own things fast or try to use some uh, archetypes that are not developed well and fix fix them your own uh, stuff so it encouraged that and also it, it uh, retained the, the the fun aspect of this like you you can um keep having fun playing pokemon that's the main reason why we play like having fun you have fun doing the the, the shiny hunting that a lot of people love i myself do and i have fun playing Uh, competitive but also doing cocks I have fun uh, building spreads I have fun doing all, all, all that good stuff so this is a really really good step that Pokemon is bringing to the table I don't know uh, competing to be honest I thought that it might be a, a good point in my life to stop Um, I have the invitation for next year worlds. Maybe I just go to day one and try to go from there. The thing is like this, this last two seasons has been so stressful, stressful for me. I had to travel a lot, a lot. Like the thing that we didn't have best finish limit from regionals was crazy and in Latam. I don't know if you are aware, but in Latam there has been a lot of, um, um, I can say drama, maybe about why we have like special events, like premier challenges. Like there have been like more than 25 or 30 special events this year. And it is not fair when there is not a best finish limit. So players that has like small countries around them can go like to one special event this week then one the next week then one the other and other countries just have one and then two months later 
another that's near so you cannot go it, it was stressful i had to to do a lot a lot of stuff sacrificing my family sometimes my wife to travel like i remember this year in may i played the first of four back-to-back -back regionals um it was like the, the worst <laughs> worst time I've ever had. I had to play my country the the week next next week I had to travel to Mexico. Then next week I had to travel to Chile. Next week I have to travel to Colombia. And I was like, okay, I'm tired of Pokemon. I don't want to play anymore until Worlds. Because that was like the, the last the last period of the season. I had to go. If I wouldn't have gone to one of those four, I wouldn't be competing competing at worlds and i wouldn't be the champion i had to go to all the four and not only go get some good points i um did a, a really good tournament in all of them i went second at mexico next week second at chile and next week second at colombia and i was so stress stressful It was so stressful and it was so um, sad that I couldn't win at least one at the point that I was really considering quitting BGC. Like, it was so frustrating when I lost the third final in a row back to back. Oof. And and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to keep, keep playing. Uh, it seems like I cannot win a final. And it was for me like a player that normally tends to, to, Um, push everything to the limits and want to win. Losing three finals in a row was so frustrating that I actually was considering quitting BGC. I remember I, 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 I was so frustrated. I was crying even like, it, it, it's, this can't be real. I lost the third final. Just whatever, I, I don't want to keep doing this. And then two or three weeks later, I was like, okay, maybe I, I'm gonna keep until worlds and see what happens yeah i can so, yeah. I, i can see how that would be uh pretty frustrating but hey you ended up winning the one that matters the most right so um <laughs> i would say that's that's pretty cool um all right so you kind of talked about maybe not too sure about competing obviously every world invite so i guess we'll see what happens i'm hoping that i can make it to dc next year as a as a spectator as a fan so hopefully we'll get to meet Um, I have a couple just real quick questions. We're gonna do quick answers on this just because I got some fan questions here that I wanted to throw your way. Uh, we got fan Fordick says, uh, how old were you when you started VGC? Um, so yeah, when did you get started? Um, I started VGC like not um, really, really competitive. I was not a really competitive player at that uh, time. I was, I guess, 22. 23 maybe yeah it was back in 2013 okay so you, about five years black and white too black and white too yeah. okay so about five years okay cool uh let's see here we already talked a little bit about that what's a pokemon that you love uh but isn't the best competitively greninja greninja ah now it, yeah, I, i'm assuming yeah. ash greninja is not allowed so just torrent or uh, protein i assume yeah i remember in 2016 i used greninja like almost a whole season I, I loved Greninja. I actually um, breathe my shiny Greninja, and, and it's a it's a fun story that the the, the Froggy seemed that never wanted to to hatch shiny. Like I spent maybe 2,000 x to get my finally my shiny Froggy. It was so frustrating. And like all day I keep with the shiny breeding, and there was no shiny Froggy, and I was frustrated. You have to be shiny, Froggy. Come on, come on this day, <laughs> this day. And now he didn't want to, to hatch until one day he hatched it, and I had my shiny Greninja and I used it. Yeah, and, that's and that's a really good shiny too. Cool. Um, real quick, I know we talked a little bit about this, but um, you know, obviously, Magic Greninja is so cool, man. Yeah, dude, it's a it's a great shiny. Um, yeah. So we're we're both married, so uh, obviously we've got the married life going on. Uh, how do you juggle between you know being married, having a family? You know your work and then and then pokemon because you know we both know pokemon can be very time consuming um you know can you give us a general idea of like kind of what your day's like just a you know a normal day when you're kind of in preparation for worlds yeah the thing is that um 
the 2018 poll is not the same as the 2016 poll. Like I've I've using some Pokemon words, I think I've evolved in in all aspects, like competitively, uh, personal, and I've uh, get I've got uh, some really uh, good talks uh, about how can you balance your life with your hobbies and with your passions and your work and your family. I know that um, it could be really tough and really hard for some people to get that balance. But when you have a wife, and in my case, I don't have kids, but you do have, and congratulations for that, man. Thank you. And you have to find or try to find a balance quickly because otherwise your life could be like having some problems. And my wife was just like the perfect, perfect option to get the balance at the beginning like he supported me with everything and he wanted she wanted to to um uh, see me happy getting my dreams and supported me so i understood i understood that i had to do more things to compensate that like she was supporting me so i had to support her too like doing more stuff that I normally do uh, in my home, for example, and uh, also my work. It's it's kind of um, it's kind of funny that I th these two years I have been so busy at work. Like I've never been so busy in my life in work. In this two years, I've been like insanely busy for me, and also I ha I've had to find time to play Pokemon and travel and train. I don't know how how actually I, I made that, but I know that there were a lot of times that I couldn't even sleep well. I had to, for example, this year for Brazil International Championship in April, I had to work on a Thursday before the event. The event was on Friday and I remember I had to like do the work for that day and the day I was not going to, to, to work. So I had to do double. So it was so stressful. I couldn't even sleep the night before. And that, that day I had to travel to Sao Paulo to compete. And I did the most craziest thing in my life. I took the plane. I arrived to Sao Paulo at 6 a.m and go to the hotel, take a shower, and they go to the late check-in and play at 8.30. It was crazy, man. Like, <laughs> I, I, I tried to sleep at the plane, but I couldn't like sleep much, maybe two or three hours. Um, and yeah, like that's that's something that people normally don't don't know about me, about any player, like the, all the effort and all the sacrifices you have to do to be in, in competing Pokemon. Like, that's why that's why I I love I love this this little game we play. Yeah, and and definitely uh, definitely props on the time management and kind of making everything work. Um, we talked a lot about your world's team. Um, I guess we'll talk really quickly about this one from Chris, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, do you have? We talked a lot about some shiny stories. What was your first ever shiny that you remember? And then is there any shiny fails that you've had? I know you've done a lot of Masuda methods, so probably not too many fails, but uh, first shiny you remember and uh, your your first shiny fail if you have if you've had one. Um, I remember my first shiny maybe was I'm not sure, but I think it was a graveler just just in at the at the grass. I I remember that a graveler, but my first um, competitive shiny that I was breeding was a uh, Dratini in Black and White Two and. Actually, I didn't even have the shiny charm at that point. I was just breeding for a competitive Dratini. When I saw the the shiny Dratini, I was like, what? Are you kidding me? I don't even have the shiny charm yet. But yeah, it was my first competitive shiny at Dratini. Very um, cool. And my first shiny fail, I don't know if I've had one, but maybe it was 
the froki I was saying before, like I spent <laughs> a month in one shiny froki all day trying to get that and and he didn't want to come. And my best shiny story, my best shiny story maybe could be um, that one that I already said about AQ slash or oh, Honage it was my, my, like the best, the best shiny story because it was the first egg. I, I didn't even expect that. Yeah. Never, never. That's, that's always a, a nice treat to get a, a, a first encounter shiny. Um, all right. So I guess we could kind of head towards a wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much, man, for coming on the channel and giving us your insight and your thoughts and everything that went into this. It's clear that you put a ton of time, made a lot of sacrifices, and 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 really played some amazing, uh, amazingly skilled high-level Pokemon to become the world champion. So just, again, a huge congratulations to you. I want to encourage thank everyone who watches this to please show some love. Check out the description below. Show some love to our 2018 world champion uh i want to kind of leave the last few minutes to you if there's anything you want to mention or say that we didn't cover yet if there's anyone you want to thank who kind of helped you along in this journey uh and any any final words man and again uh, just encourage everyone to check out the description below for your information and again from me genuinely just a huge congratulations man that's a crazy accomplishment dude and you should be really proud of yourself thank you man i really appreciate your words um well i wanted to say to every viewer that um, I'm going to be going to YouTube soon, so you can follow me on my YouTube channel of the media, Twitter. I also have a Facebook fan page. You could follow me there. Um, I wanted to first say something I forgot when we were talking about the, the team. I know I already said, and you also did, that I'm going to be explaining this a bit more in detail in my videos or my team reports that are coming. But I just wanted to say something about the Snarl uh, choice. Um, I was using knockoff with Snatch, almost almost all the, the in all the process for this team since uh, March, April until August. But then I realized that knockoff was not that good, in in my opinion, for my team because there was a lot of non um, non item. Uh, Pokemon that knockoff was supposed to hit, like for example, Cresselia. There were a lot of secret Cresselias because of the fact that they, the metagame developed at that point where Cresselia didn't want to get the extra damage from knockoff because Incinor was so common. Also, Tapu Fini, normally Tapu Fini would be used with the, with the berry, with the pinch berry, but at this point, Tapu Fini like, was the most used set I've in con I, I was uh, facing was the Sea Crystal type of Fini too. So knockoff sometimes felt like okay, this is a sitting duck or a sitting cat, just doing knockoff to getting no damage. Also, it has been intimidated like twice. It's not doing anything. So I started to realize that knockoff was not that good. I just wanted to ha have it because of Snorlax. But then I realized, okay, Snatch is way better to, to handle Snorlax. Like you, you, you can even Snatch before the fake out. So if they lead Incineroar Snorlax, trying to fake out your own Incineroar because they're faster, you can Snatch before and and, and it's it's on. Like you Snatch it the the boost and now you are plus six, plus six and you can kill Snorlax. Um, so I realized Snorlax was way better because, like I already said, Salamence was not. The 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 it, Salamis didn't have the the bulky spread that it had at the beginning. I started to fix it to give it more more speed and took from bulk. And at some point, I felt like a bit um, uh, that he Salamis didn't couldn't uh, take the the spread damage like Heatwave from Charizard or others things that it normally did back when it was bulky so i started to realize it's not was a very um very cool tech to give the team in general way more bulk like you can protect your salamis your snorlax your gastrodon one turn 
and make incinerator use null and the next turn you are like having an assault vest. Yeah, your opponent's a minus one special attacks, like you have more book. And that's that's the, the, the main thought process why I use Snarl. Like the metagame had so many special attackers. Um Tapu Fini, Tapu Lele, Tapu Coco, Guard War, uh Nagy Legal Charizard. Snarl was just I can just sit there and spam Snarl, spam Snarl, and that was a game changing sometimes. And also the fact that Snarl could go through sub like the final and it totally paid off and finally i want to give a big big shout out to all the latam community like thank you thank you so much for your help thank you for all you did and uh, at the tournament the ones that were there or the ones that were watching at home like i felt all your energy i felt all your support and i want to say a big big thank you to my friends in ecuador uh, Mr. Penguin, Raul, and Yofo and Yamit. Uh, thank you guys. You've been with me all this, all these years, and um, making me a better player and a better person. Like, thank you so much, and thank you, you a drive. Thank you for this moment and this opportunity. I really appreciate it, man. You got it, dude, and you earned it, man. Congratulations again on your 2018 Pokemon World Championship for myself. Paul here. We're going to wrap it up, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video again. Please check out the description below for all the information to go check out his content, his upcoming YouTube channel, his Twitter, his Facebook, and of course, that uh, team report, which I'm very eager to read. Uh, I wish you the best, man. Enjoy the time as champion. Go spend some time with your wife. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. I know you got to get to work here in a little bit, too. So again, thank you for your time. And thank you guys for watching. Until next time, we'll catch you guys later. Peace.